Hello and welcome to this round 10 of Grand Prix Brussels. We can see Miguel Castro, he's on red, black, chain wheeler. That a deck we know fairly well, but Nicolo Botti on the right hand side of our screen, he's still just picked up a single loss with his mono white angels list. And Raf, I'm really intrigued to see how this one plays out against one of the best decks in the format. Uh, kicking things off here, uh, a 2-1 uh, Knight of Dawn there coming along. Uh, it's got protection from, well, not quite full protection from black, but it certainly doesn't mind uh, seeing black uh, cards on the other side of the battlefield. Um, not too many of them in the red-white list, and uh, red-black list, rather, but still able to get early beats in. And History of Banalia will yeah. play very, very nicely. I feel like already the, the name of this deck should be caveated with knights and angels, given the way this has started out. Yeah, I don't think there's a single black permanent in uh, red-black Chint World decks. But having a look on the other side of things, I, I guess there are 4, 8, 12, 14 main deck angels in this list. Uh, so, yeah, may, maybe mono white angels is, is a, a reasonable epithet. In the meantime, though, the knights that are coming along here will do a good job of meaning that the red black list having to actually sort of be on the back foot a little bit in the early, early stage of the game, which is not necessarily what you would normally expect. Shall I voice a plenty there coming along? to help protect all of these uh, knights that are in play already. So no source of, uh, of green mana to activate shall I in uh, Nicolo's deck. Yeah, I mean, I guess that one of the difficulties with going wide with angels is that a large proportion of them do have the legendary super type, that meaning that you can only ever have one of each name in play at the same time. So Lyra Dawnbringer, while she will be uh, pumping up all the various angels that are in play won't necessarily be able to do that to a large number of angels at the same time as a Goblin Chainwheeler and a Beaumont Courier come down here for Miguel Castro, who just has to look on as Nicolo Botti cracks in the final act of his Tribunalia. And the good news for Castro, of course, is that two first striking Goblin Chainwheelers mean that even with the pump from his Tribunalia, attacking gets a little bit fiddly. Okay, Knight of Grace is just going to. Uh, well, Knight of Grace should have uh, the straight fortune welder here. As things stand, just shall I getting stuck in there? Lyra Dawnbringer granting plus one plus one and a uh, life link to the legendary angel. So the knights essentially have spent a large amount of time stalling the ground. Meanwhile, the air force in effect now and. Lyra Dawnbringer, the kind of card that we see being sideboarded in against Red Black Chain Willer from the likes of the uh, control decks in the field. So being able to have Lyra main deck against Chain Willer seems like it might be one of the factors that led this deck to an, eight, uh, an X1 finish on day one. Yeah, I'm not sure why the Knight didn't, didn't get in a red zone last turn. Because there's no real attack, attack back from Miguel on that turn. So the Knight would have just traded for a, a Chain Whirler opening the way for the other knights to attack the next turn on the following turn. It's not exactly too relevant since the angel is gonna are going to uh to do most of the work. But still that's uh just a couple of points there. Could have uh there we can see Shalai voice of plenty uh granting hexproof to both Nicola Botti himself, all of his planeswalkers if he had them, but also every other creature than Shalai. And that makes life kind of fiddly here because this glory bringer get, gets cast if it attacks and exerts it can only target Shalai. Shalai currently a 4-5 thanks to Lyra Dawnbringer and then of course Lyra with first strike can block quite happily well this displays something very nice I mean turn 2 knight and 3 history then 4 Shalai and 5 Lyra this is exactly what the deck wants to do however with only 24 lands, getting to 5 mana on turn 5 to cast a Lyra, that's, uh, that's optimistic. When it works, it's awesome, but I doubt this is what you see every game. Well, Resplendent Angel was the final cherry on the cake there. Uh, <laughs> alongside Lyra Dawnbringer, the Life Joy, like, <laughs> look enjoy at, the moment t-shirt, feeling very appropriate here. Miguel's just... We were like, oh yeah, well, that, that, was, that was a beating. Yeah, there was nothing I could do about that. Yeah, I mean... Miguel's draw didn't look bad in abstract ag against a random deck in this format, but against Nicola Botti's draw there, he was curving out very, very nicely, it must be said. But 
it just felt incredibly weak compared to what was going on on the other side of the table. And if you're Miguel Castro going into game two, what are you looking to do to try and turn this game around? I mean, I'm looking at uh, Nicolo's deck right now. And it feels to me that four Liras, four Shalais are just, I don't know, th these are four mana and five mana legendary permanents. And with only 24 lands, they seem pretty hard to cast. Well, we've seen that it wasn't a problem in that game. But I could see games where you're stuck with two Liras, two Shalais and three lands. And well, since Mono White does not really have ways to uh, get to more lands except maybe cycling one of the three cast outs. It's, well, it's only white, so there's no second, second color you're looking for. So are we thinking that for Miguel, the answer may be to try and go, go fast, go lean, go in early and try and get the damage in before uh, Nicolo is able to cast his more expensive spells? I think in the long run, that's probably wh where the, the deck was, will stumble. But in, a, in one game, that's... It's high. It's if you're on the wrong end and you see shall I turn like history in turn three, shall I turn four, Lyra turn five. Yeah, it's hard to. If you don't have the answer, you're just dead. It's yeah. too. It's too late. I mean, the combination of Resplendent Angel with a little bit of Life Link gone to by Lyra also very potent at creating a big old board there. And yeah, I'm going to be intrigued to see how much um, Nicolo Botti even chooses to sideboard here. It feels like his list already fairly well set up against one of the key decks in the format. I mean, there are five, five, six five drops in this, li in this list. Four, uh, four uh, Lyrial Downbringers and two uh, Angel of Sanctions. Well, I mean, you can see Miguel Castro just sort of staring off into the distance there, trying to figure out whether or not it's on him to change very much or just to hope that his draws end up being a little bit stronger here for his game two, because game one, you know, under 10 minutes, all done. Nicola Botti just able to power on through as he must have been doing for the whole of day one. I mean, 8-1 after nine rounds, a very, very uh, happy position to be in. Uh, if he can repeat that again, we will see him in our top eight. These players just finalizing the last little bits of their sideboarding. Uh, important to work out uh, how they're going to do things post-board. And it will be Miguel Castro that's on the play, which if the, the plan of getting in lots of damage before the, the key Lyra Dawnbringer can come down ends up being the winning line, going first will certainly help, at least in this second game. I like the authority of the consoles in the, in the, si in the Nicola sideboard. How does it work with the Resplendent Angel? Well, I mean, Resplendent Angel needs you to gain quite a bit of life before you're generating yeah. angels, I, as I recall. Is it, is it for life? I think so, yes. I said, doesn't. But I mean, even just shutting down, More well, time. haste in the Red Black Chainweller deck, but also against the likes of your uh, mono blue lists that are churning out tokens with Psy, it means that they aren't going to be able to improvise. It seems like it's, it's got a nice, uh, nice position in this format. Yeah, not not great against Fog, for example. This is one Spyglass in the sideboard. Yeah, it feels to me like against specifically Fog, this might be a bit of a, a tricky matchup. Yeah. Two prepare to fight in the sideboard. Interesting. And no green to uh, to fight. Can only prepare. Sometimes it's all just about being prepared, Raf. It's good enough for the Boy Scouts. It may well be good enough for Nicolo Botti. All right, these players drawing their opening hands. Uh, they've taken a bit of time to sideboard, but considering how long game one took, that seems kind of fair enough. It will be Miguel Castro on the play here for this second game with his Chainweller list. He's got a Glorybringer in hand. He's got some basic lands to work with. Nothing on turn one, but that not necessarily too much of a surprise from Chainweller. It's not got as many one drops as the more dedicated mono red lists. When I see this list, I, I just want to like Start brewing, because <laughs> I see I see prepare to fight, which is a pretty good idea with uh, Resplendent Angel. It's just yeah. too bad that you can't flash it back. You can't play, uh, use the aftermath ability. So I c what I could see, s let's say, change like a couple of planes for uh, for Sembler Groves, and maybe play some uh, Field of Ruins instead of the Scavenger Grounds. Potentially, yeah. I mean, and maybe a couple of forests. Your Shalai in principle gets a little bit better as well, but Resplendent Angel, the first uh, threat on the battlefield. I here need from five Nicolabotto. life, yeah. 
Five life to generate a 4-4 four, four angel. Um, it's, yeah, it's pretty good with prepare. Plus two, plus two life link. Yeah, this, the, that stacks up very neatly. Rekindling Phoenix coming down, meaning that prepare would be even better here. Uh, but cast out deals with Rekindling Phoenix. That clearing a path for a Splendent Angel to get attacks in. 3-3 three, three, fly for three. Already an exciting rate before you worry about all of the extra text on that big angel. Glowbringer here would be pretty good five drop. Well, that yep. is what we have. And you see it essentially came onto the battlefield exerted there. Knew that it had a clear target in that Resplendent Angel. Taking it down at the first opportunity. Knocking the Lobotti's life total down on the same swing. But seal away dealing with the Glory Bringer. This is where one, one of the areas where white does rather nicely. Its removal, a lot of it is exiling creatures, meaning that for the likes of Rekindling Phoenix or Scrap Heap Scrounger, they're not going to be coming back anytime soon. Yeah, unlike unlike blue white, these seal aways and cast outs are not as good against Glorybringer though, because well, cast outs is fine, but seal away not as good because it's already got to do its, its work. Yeah. It's already been out to attack. So you're still gonna do a one for two, cast out and your dead creature for Glorybringer. Unlicensed disintegration in hand for Miguel Castro. It will have plenty of good targets at some point. But in the meantime, here comes Hazaret the Fervent. Enough cards in hand that currently the god is inactive. But there's still plenty of time for that. Nicola Botti, just a cycle there, end of turn, in order to make sure his draws stay strong. Up to six mana now. So prophecies of mana being an issue proving not to be too big a deal. Shalai coming down and Shalai, well... It's going to get cut. Yeah, I mean, naturally always has a target on her head because once she's in play, she is the only target. Cut to ribbons dealing with the legend and Heart of Kieran coming along post that spell, meaning just the one card in hand. Hazaret coming in, Niccolo Botti dropping to 15. So Miguel had the choice between playing Heart of Kieran and Disintegration on that turn and keep the cut ribbons in hand. However, cut, cut does not kill uh, Lyra Danbringer. So, uh, yeah, and Miguel is keeping the disintegration for the bigger angel. All right, Benelish marshal the play here, but oh yeah, well that's. It turns out that every now and again, even mono white needs to double check which lands it's tapping, and resplendent angel coming along after the marshal. So resplendent angel of four four, thanks to the pump ability of Benelish marshal. The marshal, one of the the cycle of triple color cards that has been exemplified by Goblin Chain Whirler uh, and still a uh, champion. Uh, we've seen some, uh, some uh, shade. No, Jet Shade. We've seen them in, uh, in Birmingham in uh, Mono Black Control. It's true. The Mono Black list that was pretty exciting to watch but ultimately hasn't done too much in Standard t so recently. There we saw Hazaret discarding a Dragon Skull Summit in order to make sure that she was still able to attack in here. Just four life to work with left now for Nicola Botti. We might have a very quick main match on our hands here. Game one went very s swiftly. Game two, it's pretty quick also, albeit in the opposite direction. Some life gain here would be pretty important. Six mana to pump up the Angel, but unlicensed disintegration is enough for the scoop there from Nicola Botti. We'll be going to a game three here. Enjoy the moment, Nicola Botti. You're on camera for now, and if you can keep winning, maybe you'll even be able to extend that moment throughout more of today. Miguel Castro, he's on eight and one, so he definitely, at the moment, has a good shot at making top eight, but we have a few more Red Black Chain Whirler decks to choose between, so even if we decided that we wanted some more Red Black Chain Whirler on camera, not guaranteed that we would be getting loads of Miguel Castro, depending on how things play out in these next few rounds. Yeah, the problem with this Angel deck is that Except for Shalai, this it has nothing against uh, Disintegration. And Shalai is going to be Disintegrated. Or cut. Yes. So Lyra is uh, 5 mana. Pretty vulnerable angel. Yeah, it's, it's... As with many tribal decks, it's a deck that if you can get lots of your key cards out at the same time, your deck looks incredible. But... The way that tribal decks typically end up being powerful is by getting, by having those multiple things in play at the same time. If you're able to one for one, early, then it can work out that they kind of never really feel like they've got going. 
So some little spot adjustments being made by each of these players. Uh, Castro now has a slightly better idea of what he's playing against. That's one of the cool things that we see on Good Morning, Morning Magic on a Sunday, is players having to make these immediate adjustments to a deck that they maybe hadn't prepared for quite as much as most of what's going on in the, in the standard field. These guys just making their last little amends. We will get a chance to show you more magic from our other tables in the feature match area. Uh, this is not just the only match that we've got going on. And gradually over the course of today, we'll also be bringing you results from the, uh, the other tables that have been happening here. So we've got, in addition to the match that we see here, uh, Timur Fatkulbayanov uh, is playing uh, Niels Gutierrez von Porat. Uh, Alexander Gordon Brown is playing Thomas Mechin. Those two uh, on tables two and three. Um, and we'll potentially even be able to get you some more action in our feature match area from then. Uh, also, if we happen to get key results, if, if you guys sound off in chat about particular things we want to hear about in terms of results-wise, we can bring them through to you as well. But the standings as things went uh, overnight, uh, we had a few players undefeated. Alexander Gordon-Brown, Thomas Mechin, who are in our feature match area right now, uh, they are still undefeated. Pascal Viren and Socrates Rosaikis also undefeated. Um, but when we look a little bit further down the field, we see that it's been a good, a good day for the Greeks. They've, they've had a, a good set of players undefeated on day one. Martin User there, the Pro Tour finalist, not far behind the pace on 24 points. Um, but in terms of big names, not necessarily a standout uh, tournament for names coming through. It seems like there's been maybe, I guess, a split of players that have ended up here rather than in Orlando. Uh, on top of that, I guess that this is a standard format where the opportunity to come along with a deck that is miles in front of the field may be a little bit uh, smaller just because this standard format, it's been around for a little while and people have, have tested it fairly well. Actually, it's not been around for that long. <laughs> no, the I new format's been around for like a couple of weeks and the, 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 the Pro Tour, the effects of the Pro Tour, the changes that happened there, it's only very new. Like, I, I guess the, the, the question for me is how big is the impact of, uh, com of, the, of the new set? I think it's very big. Like only now, the, the format has been played at Nationals mm -hmm. and at the Pro Tour, but the Pro Tour showed a lot of new decks and new, uh, new ways to attack the format. And I think this GP shows that there's a lot more than just red-black. Yeah, I mean, the, the days of... Red-black against red white-blue are gone. Yeah. And that's, I think it's great. I love it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, also, it's very heartening to see the likes of a Mono White Angels list doing well. Um, the the Red White list that we saw last round that made day two. Like, the fact that there are different angles of attack on this format, certainly a point of interest to players going in. While some nationals have already taken place, there are still some nationals to come. Uh, English nationals will be very, very soon. And it will be interesting to see how much the information from the likes of this GP and, of course, the GP going on in Orlando changes the face of what people want to be doing at those events. Czech Nationals. Yep. Slovak Nationals next week. Hong Kong Nationals this weekend. Oh Singapore. Yeah. A whole bunch of Nationals going on. Uh, Nikola Botti here going down to six cards. Not exactly where you want to be against an aggro deck. The red decks more able to punish slow draws than some of the other decks in the format. Botti here. He will be thinking not like this. Meanwhile, Miguel Castro, we all do it. We can't help it. Just that thought of maybe it'll be five as he shuffles his opponent's deck after this mulligan. The red decks in the room, always the, the kind of ones that set the set the pace on how formats go. It's, it's pretty much only when there's a very quick combo deck that you can expect red decks not to be able to be kind of at the front end of the speed limit on the format. Is this six going to be good enough for Niccolo Bossi? He's going for a scry, so it <laughs> looks like it will be. <laughs> that looked more like a, a, a draw than a... <laughs> Let me sc uh, scry this one. It got scryed to the bottom, so potentially Bossi here seeking out additional land. Bomat Courier on turn one. This is the kind of draw that can punish things. All 
Right, so we do have a knight on turn two here from uh, from Bossy, that knight of grace, meaning that he's got something going on the early turns. One of the, of the problems that I see with this list as well is that there's nothing to do on turn one. You don't you don't get any advantage. Yeah, I mean, at one. that point, you might as well be playing a tap land that gives you access to a little bit that's of green mana. That's what I was thinking. So, Beaumont Courier able to attack in there thanks to an Abraid dealing with the Knight of Grace. Niccolo Botti dropping to 18 and the, and the little uh, Courier bug there. A second parcel in its pouch. Another Knight of Grace coming along, but no third land here for Niccolo Botti, and that could prove critical in this game. He doesn't have that much that he can be doing on turn two. His deck really coming alive once it hits the three, four, five mana mark. Yeah, this deck cannot win on two lands. A lot of decks can. Uh, Mono Green Stumpy, Stump leave, uh, yeah, still leave Stumpy can win on two lands and with huge monsters. This deck, the only thing it can do with two mana is uh, is a knight. A small I reprieve there, as Miguel Castro didn't have too much going on on his turn three. He wasn't able to attack with Bomac Courier and just a tapped land there, so blood in the water. Nicola Botti going for a little bit of an attack here. He must have something as a follow-up. It's, well, a walking ballista for one. If there's going to be a, a goblin chain whirler in the future, this means that at best all it's doing is killing off Bomac Courier. And that's what I, what I mentioned in game, uh, after game one. So yes, when the deck goes off, play land turn three, turn four, turn five, and plays angels every turn, that's, that's great. But when you're stuck on two lands and you draw another Lyra, that's exactly what happened now. He's stuck with two Lyras in hand. He's so far away from, from actually playing it. And the worst thing is, well, he still has three draws to maybe play Lyra. And these three draws, how, how likely is it that he draws another Lyra or another sh or Shalai or another spell he can't cast? Well, he's drawn a spell he can't cast and has to pass things back with a Rekindling Phoenix now in play for Miguel Castro. Uh, the Phoenix, a very efficient creature before you even look at any of the text beyond flying, a 4-3 four, four, flyer for 4. The fact that when it dies, it largely gets to come back is just a bonus, really. Oh, you wouldn't play a 4-3 flying for 4. Pro probably not, but I mean, it's... Probably it's not. In, in limited, I would for sure. But yes, you're right. In constructed, 4-3 fly for 4 on its own, not good enough. The fact that it really taxes a lot of the removal in the format just makes it a bit of a staple in these red lists, though. I mean, the 3-3 three, three flying for 3, you don't even play it. And now and only, only uh, Nicola plays it. And he's a tribal deck. And if, if he finds the 3-3 three, three fly for 3 in the land to cast it, he'll be quite happy with it right here. Pianolar coming along, alongside a Thopter for Miguel Castro. So... Miguel Castro's draw, perfectly solid. On the other side of things, though, Nicolo Botti, 24 lands. He's only found two of them in this draw, though. Even with a scry to the bottom, cut here to deal with the one creature that Botti does have. Hazaret coming down here, and it looks like, yep, there's just the one card in hand, so that enough for a huge attack. Cast, a w cast out, um, sorry, uh, seal away there dealing with the god, but big attacks nonetheless. I mean, Nicolo Botti has to get there, finds a land, gets his Resplendent Angel in play, but will it be enough? I like Miguel's play of not attacking with the uh, Phoenix two turns ago. So we will overload in uh, attacking creatures on the, on the following turn. That left Nicola with a, with a seal away that he couldn't cast, so he couldn't use his mana efficiently. The difference is, if Nicola does not have a second seal away, uh, Miguel missed the damage. But if he does, he just efficiently gained, to, like, gained a, a creature this turn. So Castro here, in principle, has the option of using PNLR to stop blockers, but it may be that he just chooses to barrel through. He's got enough mana to be able to pump up that Thopter. Everybody's coming in. Yeah, he has ribbons in his graveyard, so... Just pushing as much damage as possible is uh, probably the way to go. He can trade the Angel for the Phoenix, but that's doesn't really matter. Pump three times, so that would be seven damage. Putting Nicole down to four. He will probably find uh, the way to deal the last four damage. And here we see Miguel Castro just pumping the twice. 
Oh yeah, he has a chain of whirler in hand, so to finish off the angel. Nice sequence from uh, Miguel Castro. Miguel, Nicolo Botti, even if he had a lot going on in his hand there, would probably have uh, struggled to find a way out of that one. As things stood, missing on land drops. We mentioned it after game one, a potential uh, downside for Nicolo Botti's list. On a, a single colored deck, in principle, you look at it and you think, well, maybe I can get away with fewer lands because at least my color concerns are that much easier. But I mean, curve's 20, still a big issue. I mean, 24 lands, that's... That's rough for a deck that plays six five drops. Yeah, a lot of five drops, and it makes things a little bit difficult. We will have more magic for you. Do not go anywhere. More from Grand Prix Brussels after these messages. Hello and welcome back to coverage of Grand Prix Brussels. Tim Willoughby alongside Raphael Levy here. And 
It is Good Morning Magic. We've already had our kind of cool deck for the round, and now we're going to have our apparently thus far undefeatable players for the round. So we're going to head back down to our feature match area. This is game two of Alexander Gordon Brown on Sultai Midrange, and he's up against Thomas Meakin on Turbo Fog. Turbo Fog having picked up the first game, uh, but Alexander Gordon Brown on the play here, kicking things off with an adventurous impulse. Finding a nice one. So, Thomas Meakin here on Turbo Fog, having picked up the game one, he finds himself up against a slightly unusual deck for the format. Um, it's kind of, it's got the early plays in terms of the various Merfolk we see. Here's a, a Servant of the Conduit, and then... Wild Growth Walker. Yeah, kind of a, an interesting uh, one. Intrigued to see how it, it plays out. Clearly, it's done very well for Gordon Brown here thus far in the tournament. Confiscation coup. Two in the main deck. Yeah, I mean, Confiscation coup, I can't imagine having a, f a huge amount of targets in game one here, but I guess that we'll we'll see how things are going. These are post-sideboard games, of course. No, game one, game one seemed unwinnable. Jade Light Ranger revealing a negate for... Alexander Gordon Brown here. That negates potentially pretty important because one of the ways of breaking up what Turbo Fog has going on is to engineer a position where your attacks are all lethal, your opponent has to be using fogs every turn, and potentially either multiple fogs or counter magic in order to make sure that at least one fog resolves. Something Alexander's uh, list. Game one that we haven't seen seemed pretty much unwinnable. There's no. Like there's, there are four hostage takers, four scarab gods. This is just way too slow against Fog. And the spells are Harvester, Confiscation Coop, and Blossoming Defense. Nothing that really matters in this matchup. Sideboard, though, could, um, could prove different. Because there are uh, four Negates, three uh, Siphoners, uh, three Brontodons, Vivian Reed. So all these cards are fine. Mm -hmm. Well, especially Negate. Negate is pretty good. Everything else is fine, so uh, it's probably a little, a little better after board. Now, one of the funny things always for, for folks watching again watching a Turbo Fog match is that these early turns of the game, you would almost assume that you're not going to see much more than uh, a Gift of Paradise from the Turbo Fog player in the early turns. You might see a, a Search for Escanta here and there, but it's really not the end of the world for the Turbo Fog player at all if in the early stages of the game they're not really achieving much uh, or not appearing to achieve very much, uh, just sort of filtering their draws and so on and so forth. Seven life to work with is plenty for this uh, Turbo Fog player, assuming that they're able to now start uh, leveraging the mana that they've been building up, getting a Teferi on the board, starting to cast Fogs uh, just around the time that they would otherwise be losing the game. So an upkeep fog effect here from Thomas Meachin. That kind of the timing that you prefer to see the fogs. Wrap. This is this is when you have to play it. There's, n there's not going to be anything different between the upkeep and the attack step, except that your opponent will actually draw a card, and that card might be a counter spell. It's not that your opponent is going to forget to attack. He's, he's going to attack. So you will need to fog. And if they don't have a counter spell, well, it's a little better. So negate meaning that Meachin here needing two copies of his various fog effects. But against decks that only have uh, creatures as sources of damage, a fog effect is essentially a time walk. The, the best that the, the mid-range deck can hope to achieve on its turn is getting damage through. And once, once the creatures in play are already a lethal amount of creatures, the difference between a fog and a time walk is comparatively small unless there's already planeswalkers on the battlefield. So can the pick up there? Oh there's why? also is a cleansing Teferi. nova. Ooh, cleansing nova might be really good if there's no negate. And if there is a negate, that oh could wow. be a big problem. Let's deal with all of those creatures in one go. I like that cleansing nova quite a bit. That's that's better than time walk. Yeah because it's going to take more than one turn for Alexander Gordon Brown to get up to seven power on this battlefield, most likely, in order to again start threatening life totals. I talked to Thomas last night when he was on 8-0, uh, on, uh, and he talked about his list. He said, oh, I'm pretty disappointed by a Cleansing Nova. 
interesting. Like it's not great against most of the decks in the in the format, but against this one in particular, you kill most of the creatures. There's no god, there's no vehicle. So when you cast it and it resolves, you know it's going to do damage. You know it's going to kill everything. Well, here's Teferi on a largely empty board. Two copies of Gift of Paradise now. So the life gain on that, pretty relevant. But also, it now means that untapping two lands, access to four mana here. And Teferi conveniently with just enough loyalty that uh, Jade Light Rangers not too effective at dealing with the Planeswalker, at least on its own. If this is the negate on Alexander's side this turn, it might be a little troublesome. Attacking the Planeswalker, that's typically what you want to be doing against this Turbo Fog list. Much, much harder for it to win when it doesn't have Teferi on, on deck. Yeah, that's... That doesn't do much. Actually, t t getting rid of the Gifts of Paradise in the early game is, is a good way to tag the Fog deck. Interesting, yeah, I guess that it does represent a sizable mana bump, and Vivian Reed's still dealing with copies of Gift of Paradise even now. So does he have enough mana to play both Karn and? Well, he has a Nexus yes, of Fate this turn. He does. He, 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 he has exactly enough mana to play Karn and Nexus. And this is really where this deck feels like it's going off, is when you get to do things on top of just casting Nexus of Fate. Khan getting to tick up here, representing card drawing. And you, I've heard you sometimes refer to Khan as feeling a little bit like an extra fog in this deck. Is that just because it often makes sense to be attacking the Planeswalkers first? Well, it's a fog in the, in the, big, in the early game. Now it's not, it's not a fog anymore. In the early game, they need to attack fog. The, to attack, sorry, to attack Khan and act like a fog. But in the late game, they just ignore it. So the yeah. first Nexus of Fate of the game being played. And yeah, this is not looking good for uh, Alexander, who's tapped out now. And with only uh, a 3-2 in play, Vivian could easily be ignored. Is there so with a Fog, another Nexus of Fate. Uh, search for Scanta. This is, this is not looking good for a Sultai player. Yeah, taking extra turns, getting a lot more potent once you already already have a Planeswalker or two on the battlefield. So this time, usually you see the Turbofog player play the, the Nexus of Fate before they activate that Teferi. The sequence was a little different here since uh, Toma had a uh, Sorcery to play. Mm -hmm and therefore using the mana more efficiently. I don't think he had the, the ninth mana, the ninth land, well, the, the land to produce the ninth mana to uh, do everything. So he preferred to play the search first, then draw a card. Looks like he's looking at using a different Not Teferi ability here. No, Teferi was... Teferi was used this turn already. That, that's, that's how we drew the the ninth source of mana. I think. The ninth source was drawn off the Khan, wasn't it? What was drawn off the Khan? The there, land there were two lands on Khan. Alright. Well, maybe I'm, uh, maybe I'm a little confused. Okay, tap two lands. The moment where you start cycling fog effects. Yeah tends to be the moment that you know that the Turbo Fog player is well in command of what's going on. Once this search for Ascanta transforms, yeah, this essentially all of the pieces of the, of the puzzle have been put together by Thomas here. It's obviously not impossible for him to have a bad stretch of draws, but he's drawing a l it's he's seeing unlikely. a lot of cards every turn. So as we say in French, you say les carottes sont cuites. Carrots are cooked. All right. That means it's a little too late to... Uh, the dinner's essentially ready at that point. Dinner's ready. Dinner's ready and there's a... Uh, the worst thing is that even if, even if Toma passes the turn without a Nexus, and Alexander cannot, cannot do anything, he's going to attack for three and that's it. 
Now, for Alexander here, he's already a game down, so there's absolutely no reason for him to concede here. He may as well live in hope, but right. with each passing turn, especially passing turn that's all happening for Thomas here, that hope dwindling. No, honestly, he could he could just concede and go. Like I would I would see no no harm in conceding and resting twenty more minutes before the next round. Yeah, you're on nine and zero. You're still in great shot to make top eight and managing your own sort of energy levels, I guess, over the course of one of these big two day events. It's a big deal. I mean, he's essentially keeping track of life totals and like doing whatever a judge would do. Yeah, but. He's not, he's not winning this game in a million years. <laughs> so maybe he's just enjoying the, the camera time, which yep. is possible. Get, the, get those wrists and forearms out on camera. He should do more. Like, come on, do, do something. <laughs> Might as well, you know. There's a, the there's a nexus of fate. Use the camera time to do better stuff. Yeah. Put Some hand hand gestures. I yeah, don't know. a little thumbs up every time that your opponent casts yeah. a spell, maybe. Oh yeah. Maybe tell a story with the hands. Entertain us, come on. <laughs> you're saying you're not entertained by what's going on in the Turbo Fox? Not not on the left side. I mean, you could cut the screen in, t in half and uh, just watch what's going on on the right. On the left, it's pretty still. <laughs> not dance with the cards. I don't know. Just like do some tricks. Yeah, why not? We juggle will. with the three cards. That would be quite impressive. It's not easy to juggle cards. I would be impressed. I mean, that that's a reason why I would probably, uh, you know, mess up, mess up with my uh, <laughs> my sequencing here on the Turbo Fox side. As things stand, it is proving to be a relatively elementary game for uh, Thomas Meachin here in terms of finding and casting Nexus of Fate again and again and again. Can't ticking up rather nicely at this point. This is one or two in the one or two next to the fate in uh, Thomas hand. Now in terms of the way for Thomas Meachin to actually close out this game, are we looking at a Teferi ultimate exile a bunch of permanents? I mean at some point presumably this Khan could just start making constructs here. There's no blockers. If he's confident that he's got multiple turns in the bank and that he's going to be able to do so, then having a, some sort of a source of damage might be attractive. Yeah, the first step is to uh, to make sure 100% that you are never going to pass the turn. And then uh, I don't I don't exactly know what's what his plan is, but it could be anything. So we see there, Thomas. Uh, tapping his planeswalkers, is that just his way on complicated turns of making sure that he remembers which planeswalkers he's activated and which he hasn't? He's also put a die there to indicate that he has cast a Nexus of Fate. Very unfortunate if you kind of lose track of things and forget to cast a Nexus of Fate one turn. I c that, that was one of my fears at the Pro Tour. That the first thing I was doing when I was going through the motion was play Nexus of Fate and then then think about the rest. Yes. At some point, you know, you know the thing when you uh, you forget your keys or you can't find your keys in your pocket, and you get all red and sweaty. <laughs> yeah. <you laughs> that that's the feeling you have when you think you haven't cast Nexus of Fate. Like, oh, what do oh no, it's fine, it's fine. I have I have it. I have the extra turn. I mean, uh, this doesn't strike me as a deck that very often casts multiple copies of Nexus of Fate in one turn. I know that sometimes with the taking turns lists, you might find that the most manner efficient line wow. is to cast multiple time warps or something in the same turn. Oh, you can, you can. And in the, in, the, in the later game, when you draw two, then you just cast both of them. And you're like, okay, well, I have two extra turns. Like, there was a, in the team, in the team thing, when it's game two or game three, when the, your opponent is pretty much dead, he has his team, uh, so what should I do? Should I concede? No, no, just fine. You have no reason to concede. See, that's interesting, because I would have thought in a team's game, it might be more valuable wait, to wait. Get that's, the not, that's not the end of my story. So then I start going off, and uh, so my only uh, my only concern is to have an extra an extra turn after that. So since my opponent was just looking at me, I was like, okay, look, what I'm going to do first is play my Nexus. I play Nexus, Nexus. So I have two more turns, and then he uh, he starts like watching my what I was doing, 
and he looks at his seaman like, please, 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 <laughs> let, 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 let me do something else. Yeah. And then he scooped. Didn't see the, the end of it. Because there's no... I mean, there's no point. You do, you're, you're pretty much dead. Just show me how you kill, how you kill me. No, I'm, I'm just going to enjoy this. Yeah, I mean... And I'm going to enjoy it. This is very much a deck for people that want to enjoy the moment and make sure that that moment lasts. Khan gradually slimming down the deck, Teferi gradually thinning down the deck, meaning that the four copies of Nexus of Fate rep representing a gradually larger and larger proportion of what's going on for Thomas Meechin as each of these turns passes. You know, that, you know what would be very good now? What's that? But I don't, th I don't think Steven has it in the, in the bank, but like uh, an elevator music, a lounge music. <laughs> That would be great. Get Rich out playing some classical mm. piano. Mm. Mm. Little jazzy, a little, yeah. ja a little jazz while. Uh, Alexander Gordon Brown here. It's like you're, just, wait, you're waiting watching. for you to get to your, to your level. No? I, I must admit, I ha my elevator here getting, on, getting out of the, the hotel this morning, someone had pushed every single button and I was just having to wait on every floor. That is essentially what Alexander Gordon Brown's experiencing now. So, what do you prefer? Do you, uh, you prefer watching your opponent go off with turbo fog or waiting in the elevator to, to reach turbo your fog every time to reach your floor yeah like this, this is what i was queuing up for i i like watching turbo fog go off at least for now and also there's a construct in play now so we're going to start seeing some attacking admittedly the attacking it's going to take a while for the constructs to be large and in charge but there's a lot of extra turns i don't think there's going to be any worry about these constructs dealing the full 20 points What's what is it? Death of uh, Death a thousand, of a th thousand cuts. A thousand, yeah. The thing is, that they never make never make another construct. Just attack for one. Oh, that would be the the unkindest cut of all. <laughs> That's finds another nexus of Oh, here we go. All right, here's the handshake. I mean, if you were gonna do that, Alexander, you might have done that. Might as well have done that. What, 10, 15 minutes ago? He, he didn't know. He didn't know about the the wind condition. I mean, can't can't have been in play for a little he while. Didn't know. Alex, uh, um, Toma didn't show that he knew about it. Maybe he'd only read the earlier books of the Urza Saga cycle, so he's thinking that Khan was just a pacifist. And yeah. Unfortunately, he found out that Khan is, you know... Well, he's, he's still a pacifist. The constructs aren't. No, yeah. He's, he's got friends now, and those friends are perfectly happy to defend him. But we're going to get a chance to see a little bit more magic from one of our other Time Walk matches here. Dmitry Butikov on Grix's mid-range at 7-2 oh, wow. against Glenn Mijin on the other side of things. Red-green monsters. I haven't seen a, a brawler in a while. Yeah, it's, it's been a little while. The Voltaic Brawler already in the graveyard. Still leave Champion here getting cast off two copies of Ether Hub. A little bit of a messy mana base situation going on here. And Essence Scatter now means that Glenn, his mana in future turns is going to be very awkward indeed. No energy, or sorry, just Here's the one. one point of energy left. He got, he got uh, energy from the Brawler. Another uh, Brawler. Another Voltaic Brawler, all right. To charge these... Uh, these hubs in abstract i feel like this this red green monsters list almost by definition it must be a little bit unusual because we, we've just not seen these sort of things before grix's mid-range feels like it ought to have a fairly good matchup just because it's a deck full of answers to assorted creatures syncopate they're dealing with the second voltaic brawler that came down that one's getting exiled and yeah, I mean, this is the reason that Grixis feels like it ought to do all right here. Consistently able to keep creatures off the board, being that Ronus the Indomitable, just kind of hanging around watching what's going on rather than really getting involved in the action. Butikov, one of the more feared players on Magic Online. Very, very active in the online game. Cast Liliana. Find a Scarab Guard. That not a bad one to get back at some point with your Planeswalker. For now, just generating zombies. I like the zombie knights and the little zombie knights token, just in case. You never know. Or, uh, what was his name? Jozu? I haven't seen this guy in a while. Yeah, Liliana's brother. Does not let being dead get him down. So, Glenn here... 
he's got up to five mana, and given that he's playing a deck entitled Monsters, I would certainly hope he's got something big and impressive to play here. Goes for Rekindling Phoenix, that one we know fairly well. A solid creature that may actually be able to hang around even in the face of... Oh, the wow, to the dome. Oh, wow. I, w I was not expecting that. Yeah, I mean, typically when there's a Planeswalker that you can knock down, there's a strong temptation to do so. I mean, he's giving the choice to Dimitri to block or not. If he attacked uh, Liliana, I think that would have been an like, insta-block. Yeah, absolutely. That's what that zombie's there for. Wow, is that, is, that a, is that a trap? Why would you attack Dimitri and not Liliana? Yeah, Butikov here really thinking through what's what the damage potential is from this red green monsters list. So the only reason is that if he expects Dimitri to uh, bring the Scarab God back, then he can attack Liliana with the Phoenix. But still, that that doesn't that doesn't make sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like if you're Butikov, your answer ends up just being fine. I'll take that damage and carry on on my merry way. Get the Scarab God into play. Keep all of my mana available for a potential removal spell. Another Voltaic Brawler. That, the one that got bounced moments ago. There will be a used to uh, charge the Harness Lightning to probably kill the Scarab God. But then it's going to be a a steel, a zombie, a zombie leaf champion coming back. Yeah, the full mana available so that this Scarab God will be able to get something back from a graveyard. I mean, Glenn is currently a game up in this match. We, we kicked off in game two here. So Rekindling Phoenix going after Liliana. Ronus, the Indomitable, continues its assault on Dmitry Butikov here. So the Scarab God hanging around will start to bring back creatures from graveyards pretty shortly, one would imagine. Step one goes for the Voltaic Brawler here. Yeah, well, that's probably just better than the champion. Yeah, I guess that the, the extra claws on the Steel Leaf champion not going to be too, too relevant, relevant no. here. Since it's the end of turn, the Scarab God will only come back at the next end step, at uh, Butikov's next end step, so he won't be able to cast it on his turn. Yeah, good timing there from Glenn. The Scarab God, it's had enough play in standard that people have a fair idea of the key interactions with it, but easy in the heat of the moment to forget about these things. Glenn is still sitting pretty. Yeah, 20 life, he's got threats on the battlefield. And not the worst. It's interesting because obviously we've seen Ronus the Indomitable a fair amount in our mono green lists. We've seen Rekindling Phoenix quite a bit in our red lists, but seeing the two working together is something pretty new. And Butikov, he's got a bit of thinking to do here. While his Voltaic Brawler is larger than Voltaic Brawler on the other side of the battlefield, it's not clear that by attacking that he's going to be in great shape in this race though he has got rid of all of the cards left in Glenn's hand Glenn in top deck mode though I would say that red green monsters just based on the name likely to be one of the better decks for top decking in principle because it's got some pretty high impact threats now with the six land that's that's gonna be a huge attack yeah so Ronus the means that even the lands are a good draw here so the brawler is Four power, so he's going to trade. And the Phoenix going to deal eight. Ron has five. So that's 13 damage. Dimitri's on two. Crikey. This is a ton of damage coming through from this red green monsters list. Currently one nil up. Looks like it could turn into two nil in just one more attack step here. It has to be some pretty specific removal here. I, I'm looking for a, a Vraska's Contempt on Rekindling Phoenix here. As, as the starting point for Dimitri to get back no, in this game. Yeah, it would, that would actually be enough. Because 
uh, Ronas would not be able to attack. Assuming that there was then not a big creature on the top of Glenn's deck. I don't think there are so many. Well, well there's the Vraska's Contempt. Let's, let's see wh what's next. But, I mean, Voltaic Brawler, it could be a champion. No, he cannot. Can he cast a champion? Oh, he could cast a champion. But Heart of Kieran does not, does not help. All right, now so a Brawler would work because he would... Uh, oh, but he could have, he could have uh, pumped the Brawler to attack with Ronas. Yes. So any creature would actually work. So Butikov briefly got himself some breathing room, but he's on four and potentially facing down a lethal attack next turn. Yeah, he needs uh, a Gearhawk and another land. Champion of Wits here. That'll draw him a couple of cards, but this is kind of a desperation draw really here. The Champion of Wits itself not doing too much. Bontu's Last Reckoning getting discarded. To the yeah, champion's yeah. ability. Not too good in the face of uh, Ronas and uh, Heart of Kirin. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how mass removal has uh, has changed in the face of vehicles. And gods. Yeah. Indestructibility and indomitability in a different fashion. Sad to see Nicol Bolas having to get discarded there, but Dimitri just really needing his lands. Keeping mana up. Do we have Fatal Push for the heart? Well, a braid. A braid will do it. Oh, are we seeing a comeback here? Now we have a blocker for Aronis. Yeah, this very close. Scarab God coming back down. Not a whole lot of extra mana available to Dmitry Budikov this turn. Glory bring off the top. Oh, will wow. that do it? It will. There's the handshake. Glenn Mujin picking up the win there over Dmitry Budikov. We see some nice decks in the feature match area this round. Red Green Monsters picking up the win there against a very experienced player with a good deck. Kind of intrigued to see how that one plays out in future turns. Uh, our Mono White Angels list, two losses, so that one's still very much in the thick of things. And then we have, well, Nexus of Fate doing what it does, taking all the turns and bringing us more action here at Grand Prix Brussels. Of course, round 11 coming up soon enough. It'll be Riley and Simon right after these messages. Don't go anywhere.